This is the Bahamas Tonight Northern Edition. the Bahamas tonight, the Northern Edition. Good evening, all. I'm Megan Shepard. Thank you so much for tuning in. Topping news, the Customs Department boasting of a banner 2019 as far as revenue collections is concerned. The head of collections says this achievement can be linked to hard work and greater scrutiny by customs officers. Jimmy Lamizic reports. Despite challenges brought on by Superstorm Dorian in September, the Bahamas Customs and Excise Department Northern District is reporting that 2019 was a good year as far as revenue collections is concerned. Officials say they are happy to report that the department collected $91,085,678.14. Customs Superintendent and Officer in Charge of the Grand Bahama District, Gregory Jones. This figure um, uh, reflects a $10 million increase over last year, physical 2017-2018, which the total figure at that time was $81,755,028.53. This, I might add, is a combined three-year comparative. This is, these are revenue collections coming from the, the, the ports of West End, Freeport, Walker's Key, and, and Grand Key. Figures show that there was an increase in revenue collected in West End. Last year's collection in West End said to be at $1,409,626 compared to $1,295,655 in 2018. Collections in Freeport last year amounted to $89,267,222.31, while 2017-2018 18's figures stood around $80,157,133.77. In the last two years, we have seen an unprecedented 24% increase in our overall revenue collections. Some of the significant contributing factors of this significant treat increase are as follows. Um, it is yeah, as a result of the high tariffs on tobacco and alcoholic product products and their increase on VAT, um, which was increased from 7.5%. The value added tax collection reported for the 2017 and 2018 period reflect a total of 18,255,698.31 However, we have seen a significant increase in the VAT, VAT collection for 2018 and 2019 period, which reflects a total of $28,644,500.11. Jones says additionally, the department has also increased their enforcement efforts, and they're pleased to report that 117 reported offenses against the Customs Management Act were adjudicated. As a result of this exercise, revenue was yield at $1.1 million. I want to make it clear that our focus remains steadfast on, one, conducting surveillance, investigating all alleged offenses, information and intelligence gathering, entry checks and shipment examination. He says, post Hurricane Dorian, they have also seen an increase in passenger arrivals as well as departures. Jamila Mizek, Saturnest Network News. A possible fallout in the real estate market, an issue for some here in Grand Bahama. But Jamila Mizek tells us that there is no sign of a challenge at this point. There is a concern that Hurricane Dorian could significantly disrupt the real estate market, but some realtors are telling a different story. Real estate agent at HG Christie Freeport, Catherine McClay says, since the storm, a number of locals have shown an interest in purchasing land, and there has been some land sales in areas that are higher up. She says there has also been some home sales. And that took a little bit of time because people had to go through the insurance process and, you know, deciding on whether or not they were going to be able to rebuild or if they even wanted to. So, but there have been, there have been some, um, some mi middle range home sales. 
Catherine says although Hurricane Dorian was an oddity, low-lying areas are always a concern. But she says if persons are going to be in a lower area, they should build with some elevation and some degree of safety in the event of storm surge. Change the way you build it. Don't build it on the ground. Build elevated whether you go on stilts or just have some, some form of elevation. Look at the material that you're building with. There's a lot of new technology out there that I think can really help with, um, with people building homes here and obviously with a, a reputable contractor as well. And for first-time home buyers, she's sharing this bit of advice. Really do your own due diligence to have a really good look at the area, look at the, to the, the topography of the area, look at how it, how it lies. If there's any elevation, um, if you can, you know, if you're in a hollow, you know, it may look really nice, but in a hollow, that's where the water's going to run. So look at where look at where you're building. Look at the homes around you to see how much water they had. Um, it's, it's just a very, very good idea to pay as much attention to the area as it is to your financing. Meantime, real estate broker James Saul says, despite the storm, there are still some foreign investors interested in purchasing land on the island. He says, now is the time to invest, and he's optimistic that the economy will get better. This is a buyer's market. So if you're thinking about it, the marketplace and you're thinking about investing in real estate, there's not going to be a better time now to invest. And the prices are absolutely as low as they possibly could be. And I, my predictions are that the market's going to rise because I believe that the hotel's going to open and I believe that the government's going to do the right thing and get this airport going and get money invested in there and Western Atlantic University and Carnival. And that's going to be a game changer here with new jobs. And, but the, uh, the possibilities are, are still there. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about the marketplace. Cautious and realistic, but optimistic. Jamila Mizek, ZNS Network News. In other news, the opposition progressive Liberal Party launching a scathing attack on the government and the Grand Bahama Port Authority for what they call unacceptable post-Dorian performance. The party leader holding a press conference on Grand Bahama this afternoon addressing a myriad of issues related to this island. Italia Hall has the story. The leader of the opposition, the Honorable Philip Brave Davis, was joined by party chairman and party supporters at a press conference at the party's headquarters on East Sunrise Highway. Davis expressing concern about what he calls the slow pace of hurricane restoration efforts on Grand Bahama. He says some residents have also expressed that they are being neglected and abandoned by the government. The PLP leader also taking the Grand Bahama Port Authority to task for its post-Dorian performance as well. The government has further confused the issue by creating a ministry for disaster relief and then a disaster relief authority and put in charge of those agencies politically divisive figures. This is quite regrettable and slows down the pace of recovery. The leader of the PLP says the city of Freeport is not clean and there is too much garbage along verges. He then took issue with the Grand Bahama International Airport. He says four months after Hurricane Dorian and the airport is still not fully functional, which he says is having an impact on the tourism industry. I read in this morning's press that the government plans to buy the airport. But while in principle, I believe that services of this kind ought to be owned by the government, I am concerned that the private authorities that have responsibility for running and managing the city are in fact abandoning the provisions of the Hawksbill Creek Agreement and simply skimming profits without living up to their responsibilities. Now this week, the Grand Bahama Utility Company announced that the water supply is currently at 25% portability, and it will take a while before they achieve full portability, while Davis calls it unacceptable and says an investment in reverse osmosis is required to supply the city with fresh water. He also questioned the status of the Grand Lucayan Resort saying taxpayers' dollars were used to purchase the property, yet vendors in the Port Lakaya area are complaining that they are not making much of a profit. As it relates to East Grand Bahama, 
Davis says downed power lines and debris still remain an issue. Nonprofit organizations, he believes, have been a lifesaver for residents in the East. The government's presence is minimal at best. I believe that the government can help by trying to provide resources, for example, to the fishermen of the area to get their boats back in the water so that the bone fishing business can resume. The leader of the opposition says he is of the view that the restoration of Grand Bahama and Abaco rises above partisan issues. He says the PLP has reached out to the government to offer assistance, but the government has refused their help. It's Halia Hall, ZNS Network News. Now we contacted the Minister of State for Grand Bahama for feedback on the PLP leader's comments. Minister Thompson telling our newsroom that the people of Grand Bahama require real relief and the government will not play politics with the post-Dorian relief effort. He assures that the government is fully engaged in the restoration of Abaco and Grand Bahama and will not be drawn into a political debate at this time. Meantime, over in Abaco, Abaco Big Bird, that island's poultry producer is trying to rebuild. The farm took a licking last year during Hurricane Dorian and despite a tremendous financial loss, producers are determined to press on. Just a few months before monster Hurricane Dorian, Abaco Big Bird Poultry Farm had plans to expand its operations. The 100-acre farm produced poultry for the market, as well as grew avocados and Persian limes. Post Dorian, however, operations manager Lance Pinder says that the farm is inoperable, and he estimates that they lost around $1.5 million worth of assets. All five poultry houses were pretty much destroyed. The one you see behind me looks like it's okay, but it's <laughs> actually structurally not. It still needs to come down. Um, all the avocado trees were completely uh, toppled over, broken branches. We lost the whole crop this year. Um, the Persian lime trees, the orchard is pretty much destroyed where the avocados, they, they will come back, but the limes are, are, are gone. Pinder does note, however, that remarkably, around 100 of the birds did survive the storm. Now the family owned and operated business has had to adjust their business offerings, opening a convenience store on the property. We were still trying to clean up. Um, there was a lot of debris all over the farm. Um, we're still trying to clean it up. It is a hundred acre property. Um, and, you know, even in the first two, three months, there wasn't even so many people left the island. You couldn't even really hire people to, um, to help clean up. So it was just like me and my dad and family members that were here doing most of it. Team Rubicon, some of the NGOs came and helped out a little bit. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now. We started a little store because um, about three weeks into the storm, we're like, we really need some fresh food vegetables and because there was nothing on the island. I mean, you had canned stuff and uh, we had some frozen chicken in the freezer because our, our freezer survived and we had our generator. But, you know, lettuce and carrots and tomatoes and onions, you couldn't find anything. So we brought in a, a few cases for ourselves. We was thinking, well, maybe some other people might want some too. And it it kind of went crazy because it was the only place to get something like that on the island. He adds that they are also looking into some of the grants and loans that are being offered as they make plans to rebuild and reopen. He says the plan is to start small. Um, so we're going to have to obviously rebuild some um, barns for the, for the birds, first of all. Um, we are having to look at possibly building like a dormitory type um, structure here on the farm because obviously you need employees to run a farm. All of, a lot of our employees are living in Eleuthera and Exuma and Nassau, so it, there's, there's, that's an issue there, housing, so how do you get your people here to live? Um, and, you know, the, even this, this land we're standing on, we've been leasing this for 25 years now from the government, so we're in talks with them to see if they'll give us a grant for this land. Now, as a businessman, he says he is optimistic about the future of Abaco. I think Abaco is going to come back. Um, it's going to take some time. And I think um, 
us and, and other business people I've talked to, everybody's going to start out a little bit smaller and try to grow as Zabaco grows. I think that's the general plan I hear most people thinking about. Mick. And coming up, free dental and medical care to be offered tomorrow. The details straight ahead after this break.